Well, hello and welcome to everyone. I think people are starting to filter in. I think that are, are we all out of the waiting room now, looks like. Yes, we can go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Allison Bell. I'm the leader of the uh, GNDP theme at the IGB, and it's my pleasure to host today's seminar speaker, who is Professor Donna Maney, um, who's visiting uh, virtually from um, Emory University. So Dr. Maney uh, received her um, undergrad degree from Cornell University, a PhD from the University of Washington, and did postdocs um, at Johns Hopkins and also at the Rockefeller University. So at Emory, uh, Dr. Maney is the leader of the Bird Brain Lab, um, and she's been at Emory um, since 2002. Um, so Dr. Maney has received many um, awards, um, including as a Kavli Frontiers Fellow through the National Academy of Sciences for several years she's received that award. And she's been also been recognized um, with many awards for teaching and mentoring, um, including a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Distinguished Mentor um, Award. Uh, Dr. Maney is active in several professional societies, including the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences, and she serves on the editorial board for hormones and um, behavior. So Dr. Maney's um, lab work in, um, in this system as part of the Bird Brain Lab has been really exciting over the past decade, where she's been using white-throated sparrows um, as a model system for understanding genes and behavior, something dear to the hearts of many of us within the um, GNDP theme. So her work has been very exciting with several really great papers um, published in the last several years. Um, Dr. Maney's uh, lab has been uh, funded consistently with a steady stream of uh, awards from both NSF and NIH, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, her talk today. Just so we know, um, we're going to save questions for the very end um, after the presentation. And, and you can have a choice. You can either write your question directly into the chat and I will read it aloud, um, or feel free to raise your hand and I'll keep an eye out for you um, and call on you to, to be able to ask your question um, directly. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Maney, who's going to be telling us about inside the super gene of the bird with four sexes. Thank you, Allison. Can everybody hear me? I'm not muted. <laughs> okay, great. I've been known to start a talk muted, as have we all, right? So uh, yeah, I just want to thank Allison again for this invitation. I'm really looking forward to chatting with everybody over the next several days to hear what all of you are up to. I wanted to start just by pointing out when Jess asked me for a headshot, it should have occurred to me, although it did not, that the title of my talk here, The Bird with Four Sexes, was going to appear underneath this picture of me with the Carolina wren, which is not the bird with four sexes. So this is a bird that had hit a window on my back deck and allowed me to take its picture while it was recovering. It flew away a moment later and everything was fine. Um, Carolina wrens are super interesting, but not what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, as Allison mentioned, we're going to be focusing on a different species. So in my lab, we are interested in how social behavior evolves and how it's encoded in the genome. But as all of you know, um, genes don't encode behaviors, right? Instead, there's all these layers of stuff in between a gene and a behavior. And of course, this arrow is not unidirectional. It's very loopy. All of these layers can feed back on each other. So making these kinds of connections is really hard. So to identify genes that contribute to behavior and to understand exactly how they do that, we need carefully chosen models to help us unpack these layers. And your department is of course full of experts doing exactly that with a number of really fantastic models. And in our lab, we've been looking, working with this songbird, the white-throated sparrow. And this species has a genetic polymorphism that has affected its social behavior. And so that's what makes it a great model for asking these kinds of questions. Now, by most accounts, white-throated sparrows are fairly ordinary North American songbirds. They are socially monogamous, they're territorial, they breed seasonally. This is John Audubon's painting of them that was done in the 19th century. I'm gonna blow up this caption a little bit so you can see it better. And Audubon called this one, this bird, the male, and this one, the female. 
And it wasn't until the 1960s that it was discovered that Audubon was actually wrong about that. Either one of these birds could be male or female. This is a case of alternative phenotypes or plumage morphs. So once a bird molts into its adult plumage, it's either going to be the white stripe morph or the tan stripe morph for the rest of its adult life. There's no phenotype switching in this species. In my talk, I'm going to be referring to them as WS and TS for white stripe and tan stripe. Now, it's really easy to understand why Audubon made this mistake. Um, and that's because this species has a mating system that's unique among birds, and it's called disassortative mating. And what that means is almost every breeding pair out in the wild has one white stripe bird and one tan stripe bird. And in some cases, like Audubon thought, the white striped one is the male, but sometimes it's the female. So that's why we say it's like the bird has, like the species has four sexes, because if you are a white-throated sparrow looking for a breeding partner, you're gonna be looking typically for a bird of the other sex, but also of the other morph. And just like sex, morph is controlled by a special chromosome. So a few years ago, a uh, girl scientist wrote that this species seems to be evolving a second pair of sex chromosomes. Now, they're not exactly sex chromosomes, but they share a lot of interesting features uh, with sex chromosomes. And I'm going to be telling you all about that. So here we're looking at the karyotypes. This is the first 12 chromosomes from a tan stripe bird and a white stripe bird. And this work was done way back decades ago uh, by Bruce Thornycroft. And you can see the sex chromosomes here. You can see that both of these birds are female because they've got this W chromosome. This is the Z and in birds, males are ZZ and females are ZW. But what I want you to look at actually is chromosome two over here. So I'm going to call this chromosome ZAL2. ZAL is for Zonotrichia albicollis, which is the scientific name of the species. And then, of course, it's chromosome 2. So this tan stripe bird and all tan stripe birds have two copies of a submetacentric chromosome 2. And submetacentric, which is what Thornycroft referred it to, is, just means that there's the material on either side of the centromere is of unequal length. This is the standard arrangement for chromosome two in this species, and the tan stripe birds have two copies of that. But then look at this white stripe bird. So she's got one copy of the submetacentric version of chromosome two, but her other chromosome two is different. And Thornycroft called this zal 2 m for metacentric, meaning that the material on either side of the centromere is about equal length. Now, all white stripe birds have a copy of ZAL2M, and almost all of them are heterozygous, uh, heterozygous for ZAL2M. And I'm going to come back to uh, why that's important. So Thornycroft hypothesized that ZAL2M came about by a pericentric inversion, which is, of course, when the material on either side of the centromere breaks, and then there's this 180 degree flip and then a reattachment. And so we were able to confirm with fish mapping that Thornycroft was right about that. So here we are looking at metaphase chromosomes, ZAL2 and ZAL2M. So this is from a white striped bird. And we have two markers that are mapping on either on opposite arms of ZAL2M. But here on ZAL2, they're mapping to the same arm. In fact, they're so close together, they just look like a bright yellow spot. Um, so this does show that inversion. Now, the actual rearrangement is much more complicated than what I'm showing here. It's at least two nested pericentric inversions, and then with a bunch of micro inversions on top of that. Um, so it's way more complicated than, than, than this cartoon. But what I want you to take home here is the similarity with sex chromosomes. So the ZAL2M is like the mammalian Y in a couple of ways. First, it's usually present in only one parent. And when it is there, it is in a near constant state of heterozygosity. And what that means in that situation is you get this profound suppression of recombination. Um, so once this inversion happened, right, that you the the two uh, versions of the chromosome can't recombine anymore in heterozygotes, and this lack of recombination is what makes this this part of ZAL2M 
a super gene. So all of the genes inside this inverted region um, are tightly linked together and they're inherited together. And so what happens over evolutionary time when chromosomes can't recombine is you get this accumulation of genetic variation. This is called Muller's ratchet, right? So at this point in time, the two versions of this chromosome are now between one and 2% different, which is a huge difference for homologous chromosomes that are in the same species. Now, just like this uh, super gene, the differentiation causes them to look different, causes the morphs to look different. It also causes them to act different. So the white striped birds engage in more singing and other aggressive behaviors than the tan striped birds. And I've thrown in a little video of their song so you can see what that sounds like. This is a white striped male. He's teed up in the middle of his territory and he's just singing to nobody in particular, all of his neighbors uh, advertising that his um, territory is occupied. So it's a really beautiful, pure whistle song. It's definitely aggressive. They will direct this song to particular rivals like intruders, and they do it when, in order to signal they're about to attack. Okay, so we can measure that behavior and other aggressive behaviors by doing a behavioral assay called simulated territorial intrusion or STI. And this is, we do this in the bird's natural habitat on free living birds. And this is a picture of an STI in progress. If you look closely, you can see my postdoc, former postdoc Wendy Zinzo Kramer back here. She's wearing a big hat. You can just see her head. And she's hiding because she's doing this STI and she is noting all of the aggressive behaviors that a resident pair of white-throated sparrows are doing in response to this, what Wendy has put this cage like smack in the middle of their territory. And there is a live male decoy inside the cage. And then Wendy's playing conspecific song from this speaker. And this goes on for 10 minutes and she's gonna write down everything they do. And the behaviors they tend to do are things like flying over the intruder. Um, um, we count the, quantify the amount of time spent near the intruder, trying to get at the intruder. And of course, singing, which is mostly what I'm gonna be talking about. So here are the data for singing, and you can see that, and this is in response to a 10-minute STI, like most related uh, sparrows, the males are doing more singing than the females, but if you look within morph in both sexes, the white striped birds are singing quite a bit more than the tan striped birds. Now, this is the biggest morph difference in behavior that we know about. So this is what I'm going to keep coming back to throughout the talk. So anytime you see songs or singing on the y-axis here, this says 10 minutes because that's the duration of the STI. I'm talking about songs given in response to this um, behavioral stimulus. Now, since I see Mark here, I need to mention that these data that I'm showing you for every bird, we're looking at an average um, of two STIs, one that was done with a tan stripe male decoy and one that was done with a white stripe male decoy. And we have to do that because it turns out that the morph of the intruder is important. And I'm happy to talk about that afterwards with anybody who's interested. I just wanted to let you know that you're looking at um, the averages uh, for today's talk. Okay, so I'm going to take you all the way back to your introductory genetics class. You will remember this or you'll recognize this Punnett square. So almost every breeding pair of white-throated sparrows looks like this. There's one parent that's tan stripe that has two copies of ZAL2. And then there's the other parent is white stripe and it has one copy of ZAL2M and the other is ZAL2, the standard arrangement. So 50% of their offspring are gonna be homozygous for ZAL2 and they're gonna be tan stripe. And then the other 50% are gonna have one copy of ZAL2M and they're gonna be white stripe. So it's not possible for these two parents to have offspring that are homozygous for the super gene for ZAL2M. The only way to get that, to get a homozygote would be if a white stripe bird mated with another white stripe bird. And that happens only 1% of the time. And even then, only 25% of those offspring are going to be ZAL2M homozygotes. And so that's 
like one quarter of 1%, which turns out to be about how often uh, homozygotes have been found. So about every, out of um, 1500 birds genotyped by my lab and Elena Tuttle's lab, only three uh, homozygotes have been discovered. So it's like one in 500. And we were very lucky a few years ago to collect one during fall migration in Atlanta. She was a hatch year bird, so she should have had relatively dull plumage. She was very young, um, but instead her plumage was just spectacular. We called her morph the super white morph. Um, her plumage was like an exaggerated version of the white stripe plumage. And so we wondered if her behavior might also be an exaggerated version of white stripe. Um, we thought that she might be really aggressive. And so we tested that by doing behavioral trials with her against or paired with every other uh, female of her age that we had in the lab that year. And I'm going to show you a video of one of those behavioral trials. And these were done by Brent Horton. It's going to take me a minute to set up this video. So just bear with me. So here, this is the super white bird right here. And when she starts moving, you'll see she has a pink leg band on. Her opponent here is at the moment up on the side of the cage. Um, I need to mention this is not a resident intruder test. So both of these birds are in a novel environment and both of them have relatively equal um, experience with this type of assay. So the behaviors that you're going to see are mostly called displacements, which is where one bird is sitting here, another one comes along, and, um, and the other one moves away to get away from it. So the displacer would be the winner and the displacee the loser. So that, let's look at what that looks like. So you can see that the super white bird is doing lots and lots of displacements, and here are the data for that. SW is super white here. She's doing more per hour than the other birds in the study. You just heard her sing. She was one of the only birds in the study to sing during these behavioral trials. And she's also doing more of these other aggressive behaviors, chases, attacks, and threat displays. So whatever it is that's on this chromosome, if you have one copy of it, it makes you more territorial, more aggressive, you sing more. If you have two copies of it, you're just a total jerk. And so we were really interested in what is inside this super gene? What are the causal genes for this behavioral phenotype? Now, as we know, this line that I've drawn is a very simple arrow from gene sequence to behavior um, is, is not a straight arrow. There's a lot going on in there. It's very complicated. So how do we even begin? How do we start? How might genetic differen differentiation ultimately lead to behavioral differentiation? Where do we start looking? So there's an old idea in evolutionary genetics that genetic changes that drive evolution don't have to be in protein coding sequences. In other words, they don't have to change proteins. Many of the important changes are in regulatory regions. In other words, they change how much of a gene is expressed or where it's expressed or when it's expressed. And with our collaborators at Georgia Tech, Sujin E and her student at the time, Dan Sun, we showed that 99.9 .9 of the fixed differences between ZAL2 and ZAL2M, in other words, the SNPs, um, don't change protein coding sequences. They're regulatory changes, for example, inside cis regulatory regions like promoters. So given that result, what have we learned about the expression of genes on chromosome two? Here's a better picture of Wendy. And these are her RNA-seq data. These are from a brain region that I'm going to call nucleus tania of the amygdala, or tania for short. This region is also called the ventromedial arcopallium. And it's similar to the mammalian medial amygdala, um, both in its function, its connectivity, and the genes that are expressed there. And what this graph is showing, this is every gene that's expressed in that region in birds that we collected in the field. This is not after a territorial challenge. It's just birds hanging out. And on the x-axis, the genes are arranged from low expression to high expression. And then on the y-axis, this is the difference that we see between white stripe and tan stripe birds. So everything above the line is expressed higher in white stripe and below the line higher in tan stripe. And the ones in red, if you can see that, are differentially expressed. So there was one gene in particular immediately that stood out to us that is differentially expressed. 
And that is ESR1 that encodes estrogen receptor alpha. And the reason that it stood out to us is that the behaviors that differ between the morphs like territorial aggression depend on hormones that can act through ER alpha, or they can be converted to hormones that act through ER alpha. So this gene was a great candidate for possibly explaining the behavior. Now, the two alleles of ESR1 are differentiating uh, between the standard allele and the supergene allele. And there are some small changes in the protein coding sequence but they don't appear to affect receptor function in an interesting or meaningful way. And so we're focusing here on the expression. So our overall model that we wanted to test is that variation in the gene sequence of ESR1 leads to differential expression of ESR1, and then that differential expression leads to the behavioral polymorphism that we see. And I'm gonna start here in the middle, looking for differential gene expression. And these are data from in situ hybridization, um, again done by Brent Horton. And we, when we use when we use this technique or any, actually we we saw the same thing with qPCR and RNA seq. Um, when we quantify ESR1 in nucleostania of the amygdala, um, we found this big morph difference. And this difference is the effect size is above three. Um, it's so large that there's really no overlap between the morphs. In other words, if we know the ESR1 expression of a bird, then we know its morph. And this was true in both males and females. And not only that, but we found that the ESR1 expression predicted behavior better than morph does. So what we're looking at here is ESR1 level plotted against songs in response to STI. And we're looking at the residuals here because this is controlling for morph. So even within morph, we see this positive correlation between ESR1 expression and singing. So if we know the ESR1 level, not only do we know the morph, but we also can make a fairly good prediction about their songs in response to STI. In other words, the ESR1 expression fully mediates the effect of morph on singing. Now, an, a really important point here is that this is not the ESR1 expression in response to the STI. So we would do the STIs and then come back days later to collect the tissue. And so we're thinking, we're treating this as if it is a baseline. But as you all know, um, these are birds that are just, they're, they're in their natural habitat, living their lives. And the white striped birds are of a particular behavioral type, right? They seek out more agonistic interactions maybe. And so it's possible that because of their behavior, their ESR1 is getting driven up. And this is a correlational finding, right? And we don't know uh, what is causing what. It could be the other direction of causation, of course. Um, to try to get at that a little bit, I want to show you some data from a former postdoc, Katie Grogan, who found the same big morph difference in ESR1 expression in nestlings at post-hatch day seven, again, in the same region, in Tania. So these are babies that are still in the nest. It's long before they start singing or before they are uh, defending territories. So it seems unlikely to us that the morph difference in gene expression in ESR1 expression is driven entirely by the behavior. And we think that this difference in expression is being driven by the differentiation of the ESR1 gene itself. So next I'm gonna tell you about how we showed that differentiation of the ESR1 gene um, causes differential expression of this gene. And then how we know that the differential expression of the gene then causes the behavioral polymorphism. And a lot of the work I'm gonna talk about next was done by Jenny Merritt, a former student in the lab, grad student in the lab. Some of you may know her because she did her undergrad at Illinois. Okay, so. I'm going for the next several slides, I'm going to be considering the role of the promoter region of the gene in regulating transcription. And by promoter, I just mean the region upstream of the transcription start site. And for this work, we looked about 2KB upstream. Um, 
Now, th these ovals here are my attempt at drawing like hypothetical transcription factors, binding to the promoters and regulating transcription. So over evolutionary time, this region differentiated between the two alleles and transcri transcription factor binding sites were lost, but others were gained. And if we look upstream of the start site going about 2 kb up, we see that this has happened for about th the uh, binding sites for 300 transcription factors um, have been altered by this differentiation. So theoretically, that should cause differential expression uh, between the two alleles. So how do we test for that? Um, one thing we did was to use a reporter assay, which is done in vitro. And so we took the ESR1 gene and we removed the coding region, replaced it with a gene called firefly luciferase. Um, and this reporter gene encodes a protein that's going to promote the generation of light. It's the same protein that fireflies use to glow. Then these constructs are um, introduced into cells in culture, and the amount of light that is coming from the cells is then a direct readout of the transcription activity um, of the two promoters so that we can compare the activity of the two alleles under constant conditions. And the results showed us that there was a difference in activity. So we got a lot more of transcription activity from the supergene allele than from the ZEL2, the standard allele. Now you should take the direction of this effect with a grain of salt. And that's because the cells in the dish were not white-throated sparrow brain cells. These are actually chicken lymphoblast cells. And so the complement of transcription factors in those cells is not what we would expect to find necessarily um, in any particular um, white-throated sparrow brain region or the cells in the white-throated sparrow brain. And so the direction of this effect doesn't really tell us a lot. But what we can conclude from this is that there is enough differentiation um, between these two alleles to drive different levels of transcription. Now I'm going to come back to the promoters. I'm going to pull off um, these transcription factors and point out some spots in the DNA sequence. And these are places in the genetic sequence where there's a, a G following a C. In other words, it's the CPG sites. Now the numbers of sites that I'm showing here, this is not accurate. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that in this 2KB upstream of the start site, there are more CPG sites on the standard allele than on the super gene, the zel 2 m Now, of course, these sites can be methylated and methylation is generally thought to interfere with transcription factor binding. Now we used PCR to amplify this regulatory region in bisulfite converted DNA, and then we deep sequenced those amplicons. And that's gonna tell us the degree to which each one of these sites is methylated in vivo. And I'm gonna show you our results for Tania. And remember Tania is the brain region where we see that big difference in um, expression with the white striped birds having higher expression. I'm showing you data for three alleles. Um, and that's because I'm showing you the tan and the white allele. So this is the, um, the tan stripe standard allele cell two, which is the only allele that the tan stripe birds have. This is the standard allele in the white stripe birds. Remember they're heterozygous for this and there's no difference in methylation there. This is the super gene in, which is only in the white stripe birds. And we can see that it's less methylated um, than the standard allele. And that's consistent with um, that should theoretically um, allow more transcription, right? Uh, lower methylation um, from the supergene allele, which is what we see in this region. We see that the white striped birds have higher expression. Now, what was really interesting about this is that this differential methylation was attributable to the polymorphic CPG sites. In other words, CPGs that were located on the standard allele and then not on the supergene allele. So, so in, and not to the shared sites like these, sites that, would, that are present on both alleles. And we know that because when we limited our analysis to just the shared sites, the sites that are present on both alleles, that differential methylation went away completely. 
So what that tells us is that these SNPs are really important. And in fact, if you look at, we had RNA-seq data um, from the same tissue samples. And when we looked for CPG sites or clusters of sites that predict expression, we found that all of those clusters contain SNPs. So we're seeing this really interesting combination of genetic and epigenetic forces that potentially are causing differential expression. Okay, so I've shown you that differentiation of the two alleles has altered transcription factor binding and methylation, which should theoretically cause the two alleles to be expressed at different levels in vivo in the brain. So to test that hypothesis, we developed a qPCR assay to selectively amplify ES, the two alleles of ESR1 independently from each other. So we can look at the ratio of the standard to the supergene allele, uh, allelic expression of ESR1. And we could do this, of course, only in the white striped birds, right? Because the tan striped birds only have one allele. So here are some of those results. Each bar uh, going across here is a unique male, and the yellow shows you the relative expression of ESR1 that's coming from the supergene or ZAL2M uh, relative to, my pointer keeps going away, sorry, uh, relative to the, the standard allele, which is shown in blue. So we can see that um, in males, there is definitely this allelic imbalance with the supergene allele being expressed more. And we see the same thing in females and also in nestlings of both sexes, nestlings at post-hatch day seven. So what was really interesting is that the, the level of imbalance, in other words, the zal 2 m to zal 2 ratio, the allelic ratio, predicted territorial singing. So the more zal 2 m you have relative to zal 2 the more aggressive you are, the more you're singing, the more you sing. And again, this is that same brain region, nucleus tania. So that was really exciting because it looked like the regulation of this particular allele could be having an effect on behavior. But again, this is a correlational finding. So we set out to test whether differential expression of ESR1 is causal for the difference in aggression in this species. And to look at that, we did a behavioral study on a, a laboratory uh, housed birds. So we brought birds into the lab um, during the non-breeding season, during fall migration. So their gonads are totally regressed. Their plasma levels of gonadal steroids are very, very low. And so presumably their brain ER alpha is relatively unoccupied at that time. And I should mention that we don't see seasonal changes in ESR1 uh, between breeding condition birds and non-breeding condition. Um, and here we're looking at in C2 hybridization data for ESR1 expression in non-breeding birds. So you can see there's still um, this huge difference in the, and this again is Tania, the white striped birds having much more expression than the tan striped birds. So if this receptor population is causal for that behavioral difference that we see, we should be able to see a behavioral difference even in these non-breeding birds if we give them estradiol, okay? And so that is what we did. And in order to give them estradiol non-invasively, we injected that estradiol into a tasty snack. So this is the larva of a wax moth, not drawn to scale relative to this bird, thank goodness. So when a bird, encount a bird in the lab encounters one of these wax moth larvae, it gobbles it right up because they are uh, really, really tasty, apparently. And when a bird eats the wax moth, wax moth larva that's been injected with estradiol, the bird will get a spike in plasma estradiol and also brain estradiol that lasts for about 30 minutes. And so to do this behavioral assay, we would feed the, the focal animal um, a bird, a, a, a larva that has been injected either with vehicle or uh, estradiol. And then we would present a subordinate opponent and then quantify the aggressive behavior directed toward that opponent in the focal animal. Now I should point out that this behavioral assay is not exactly like the one I showed you before. So these birds are in two separate cages. Um, they can't interact physically, but they can see and hear each other. The aggression that we scored uh, was the amount of time that the focal animal spent on this side of the cage uh, toward the opponent. 
And we also scored something that we called attacks, which is when the focal animal would jump toward uh, this, this side of the cage facing the opponent and land with two feet. Um, this whole assay is based on one that was developed by Sarah Heimovix uh, when she was working with Kieran Soma. So I'm gonna show you a video uh, from one of these behavioral trials. So here's the focal animal here. The opponent is in this white cage over here. Now this is the focal animal has eaten the larva that had vehicle. So no estradiol here. And again, these birds are in non-breeding condition. And so the focal animal is hopping around, interested in the opponent, but nothing really interesting is going on here. So I'm gonna show you this next video. It's the same focal animal and same opponent after the focal animal has been treated with the estradiol. So she ate the larva with the estradiol. And you can see that the bird is now spending all of its time on this side of the cage. You can hear it singing and it's throwing itself up at the side of the cage and we would score that as an attack. So I'm gonna show you the data for time spent near the intruder. And the, the attack data look very similar to this. So what we're looking at here on the y-axis, this is the change or the difference in the time spent near the opponent between getting estradiol, which would be up here, and uh, getting or it's with the and then it's the it's the difference between aggression after estradiol and aggression after getting the vehicle. Okay, so anything, in other words, above this zero here, the bird is getting more aggressive with estradiol and anything below the zero, the bird is actually less aggressive with estradiol. And you can see that the white striped birds are increasing their aggression after estradiol and the tan striped birds, not so much. And so that's consistent with our hypothesis that maybe the white striped birds are more sensitive to estradiol than are the tan striped birds, possibly because of this receptor population in nucleus tania. So, but we haven't tested that, of course, here. We haven't tested that particular receptor population. The, these data that I'm showing you here are actually the control groups from a knockdown study. Um, Jenny injected antisense oligonucleotides against ESR1 mRNA into nucleus tania in two more groups of birds, white striped birds and tan striped birds, in order to knock down the white stripe expression down to the tan stripe level. Now, we also had tan stripe knockdown birds, but it's very difficult to knock down the tan stripe ESR1 level below what it already is because it's already kind of at a floor. So the data that I'm gonna show you next in these birds, nucleus tania, the white stripe birds and the tan stripe birds had low and relatively equal levels of ESR1. So we would expect under those conditions that we would not see a morph difference in behavior after estradiol treatment. Um, and that, or we would not see the same response to estradiol. And that is what we saw. So the important comparison here is between the white striped birds that did not have knockdown and they were able to respond to the estradiol treatment with increased aggression compared with these white striped birds that had the ESR1 population and Tania knocked down so that they could no longer respond to that estradiol. So in other words, we were able to change the phenotype from a white striped phenotype to tan striped phenotype just by knocking down the expression of this one gene in this one brain region. Okay, so I've shown you that there is variability in the ESR1 cis regulatory region upstream of the start site, and that affects expression in a dish. And I've shown you that the supergene allele is less methylated, and that these things lead to differential expression between white stripe and tan stripe birds. And then I've also shown you that the supergene allele predicts behavior and that the differential expression of ESR1 is causal for the morph difference in aggression. So you may be thinking, well, there must be other behaviors that differ between the morphs besides singing, besides aggression, and there must be other genes involved. And you would be right. I have not told you about all of the behavioral differences between the morphs. Um, and I am going to show you another difference in their behavior, but then I'm going to try to convince you that the same gene, ESR1, is involved in that behavioral difference as well. 
So while the white striped birds are doing all that singing, the tan striped birds are doing more parental care. This is a video from um, our field site in Maine. And this work was again done by Brent Horton. This graph shows the number of trips that the birds are making to provision young in the nest. And you can see that the tan striped males are making more trips to provision young than the white striped males. We have not been able to detect a morph difference in this behavior in females, but other labs have shown uh, a morph difference in the same direction with the tan striped males uh, provisioning more than the, I'm sorry, the tan striped females provisioning more than the white striped females, but we haven't detected that in our lab. So what does this have to do with ER alpha? Well, if you look in the medial preoptic area or palm, the tan striped males have higher levels of ESR1 than the white striped males. So this is the opposite from what we see in Tania. And this expression in palm predicts the provisioning rate in males. And once again, I'm showing you the residuals here because I'm controlling for morph. So this looks a lot like ESR1 and Tania, how it explained um, the singing behavior. The, uh, the effect of um, morph on provisioning rate is fully mediated by ESR1 expression in POM, okay? And this is the same gene, right, that we already showed is causal for the morph difference in aggression. It's just in a different brain region. So again, you may remember that in Tania, expression was higher in the white striped birds. And here in POM, it's higher in the tan striped birds. So what is up with that? So the key here may be that ESR1 actually has three different promoters um, that could be used differently in different brain regions. So Jenny Merritt showed that the relative usage of these promoters does depend on brain region. So if you look here in Tania, where the white striped males have higher expression than the tan striped males, most of that transcription is being initiated here at promoter one. But then if you look in palm, where the tan striped males or the tan striped birds have higher levels uh, than the white striped ones, um, most of that transcription is being initiated at promoter three. So the, that doesn't entirely explain why we get opposite effects of morph in these two regions. So the, but the bottom line is that there are different mechanisms of regulation of the same gene that can depend on region. So the genetic sequence between ZAL2 and ZAL2M is differentiating at all three of these promoters. And that variation is going to interact with locally available regulators like transcription factors so that the effects on expression are region specific. And of course, the consequences for behavior are gonna be really complex. So it is particularly important and interesting to me that this gene encodes a steroid receptor because steroid receptors are themselves transcription factors, and they can have a lot of downstream effects on the expression of other genes, right? This is the same graph that I showed you a few minutes ago, showing all of the differential gene expression in nucleus tania. Now, ESR1 is differentially expressed, of course, but also are a, there are a lot of other genes that are differentially expressed. And it turns out that those differentially expressed genes are enriched for steroid genes and steroid pathways, particularly estrogen responsive genes. So of course, ESR1 is probably contributing to that enrichment. Now the super gene version of ER alpha can alter expression of other genes on that chromosome, but of course it can also affect the expression of genes all over the genome, right? Because it's a transcription factor anywhere that there are estrogen response elements. These are all trans regulatory effects. So in brain regions where white striped birds have higher ER alpha, there's many other genes all throughout the genome that could be upregulated compared with tan striped birds and vice versa. So when genes in steroid pathways in particular are captured inside supergenes, you can get some really dramatic effects on phenotypes. And that's what we think has happened in this sparrow. So this is also what has apparently happened in another bird, the rough, and in this shorebird, there are three different versions of chromosome 13 corresponding to three different types of males. There's independents who display on LEX. There's satellites who hang out next to the independents and they try to get copulations that way. And then there's faders who are female mimics. 
Now their chromosomes differ uh, with respect, the chromosome 13 differs with respect to a supergene that came about by inversions, but the inversions don't share any genes in common with the sparrow inversions, zero genes in common, but they have captured at least two steroid related genes, one of which converts testosterone to androstenedione. dione. Now I'm showing you this in order to make the point that the white-throated sparrow is not an isolated case. There's at least this one other example in birds of alternative behavioral phenotypes associated with inversions. And even though they don't share any genes with the sparrow inversions, they do capture genes that affect steroid physiology. So if you ever run across a super gene that segregates with alternative reproductive phenotypes, you should look for steroid genes inside that super gene because they affect so many behaviors and systems. They're great candidates for being causal. Now, when you find your causal steroid gene, the next thing you want to do is to look at its neighbors. So people, people used to think that genes are randomly distributed in the genome. Today, we know that gene, or, gene order is not random, and genes with related functions can form clusters along chromosomes. And ESR1 is part of a gene cluster that also includes MYCT1 and VIP. And these genes are located next to each other with no genes in between in many vertebrate taxa, including humans. And the fact that it's so well conserved may mean that the cluster has an important function. So I've told you that in white-throated sparrows, the expression of ESR1 depends on morph and predicts territorial singing. The same is true of both of these other genes in the cluster. Now, MYCT1 is transcriptional, co a transcriptional activator, MYC target one. And the function of this gene is not well understood outside of its role in cancer. But we do know something about VIP in birds. So I'm going to focus on that for the next few slides. So back in 2012, some of my colleagues knocked down the expression of VIP in the anterior hypothalamus in a couple of different bird species. And they showed that that knockdown strongly suppressed displacements, which is what we're looking at here. And I've shown you that behavior before and also increased the latency to, dis to displace. So we know that this population of cells in the AH is causal for aggression in at least two species of songbird. Now, white-throated sparrows have exactly the same cell population. Here's VIP mRNA labeled using in C2 hybridization in this region. And we found that in both sexes, um, white striped birds have more VIP in the AH than tan striped birds, which fits with that knockdown study, because remember the, tan, the white striped birds are more aggressive. Now, in addition, the VIP expression in AH is correlated with song rate in both species. So once again, um, I'm showing you the residuals, controlling for morph, and we can see that VIP expression within morph predicts song rate. So this gene looks a lot like ESR1 in that it's inside the supergene and its expression predicts behavior independently of morph. Now, my grad student, Kenzie Pritchard, is, has now shown that in DNA extracted from the hypothalamus, the promoter region of VIP is less methylated on the supergene. And so this is exactly like what I showed you before with the three alleles, the tan stripe ZL2, white stripe ZL2, and the supergene. And this ZL2, once again, is methylated less. Now, remember that for ESR1, that difference in methylation was attributable to the genetic differentiation because we only saw it when we, when we um, considered the polymorphic sites as well as the shared sites. That is not what we see with VIP. It's really interesting because when we exclude the polymorphic sites, um, this difference in methylation actually gets larger. The effect size gets larger. And we can't even detect the differential methylation in nestlings unless we exclude the shared sites. So this means that the mechanisms that are contributing to the differential methylation are entirely epigenetic. So the two alleles, they're sharing the same CPG sites, they're just methylated differently, which is really interesting. And again, it's, it's the, sort of the opposite of what we see for, for ESR1. Okay, so 
VIP might also contribute to the morph difference in parental behavior. So this is the same video and graph I showed you earlier, showing that the tan striped males are making more trips to provision the offspring than the white striped males. And VIP is implicated in parental behavior because it's a releasing factor for prolactin. And this is a hormone that comes from the pituitary and it's associated with parental behavior across many vertebrate taxa, including sticklebacks. Here is a, a video of egg fanning behavior. And I took this off the internet and the person I stole it from is probably here. So please accept my apologies and let me know. Um, but anyway, that behavior is under the control of prolactin. Now in birds, prolactin release is controlled by this population of VIP cells that's at the base of the hypothalamus, the mediabasal hypothalamus or the infundibular nucleus. And here's that in C2 hybridization here. This is the immunohistochemistry showing these cells coursing down to the median eminence where they're gonna release VIP into the portal vasculature and then stimulate the release of prolactin. And we found that in this population, the tan striped males have higher uh, uh, levels of VIP mRNA than the white striped males. We don't see it so much in females, but remember we don't see a morph difference in behavior in females. Now, Kenzie's currently following up on this to see if we can detect a morph difference in prolactin mRNA or maybe even prolactin in the plasma. But the take home here is that the genes inside this supergene might increase parental behavior, maybe at the expense of territorial behavior and vice versa. So let's go, let's work through that a little bit more. So I've told you about these two genes that are differentiating inside the supergene, ESR1 and VIP. And expression of ESR1 in Tania and expression of VIP in AH both predict aggression. And they are higher in these regions in white striped birds, which are more aggressive. And then in contrast, ESR1 expression in palm and ESR1 expression in the infundibular nucleus predicts parenting. And again, it's the tan striped birds that are more parental and they have higher levels of these genes in those regions. So together, these genes might be mediating a life history trade-off. This is a scene from Tropic Thunder that I thought illustrates this idea well. It's really hard to do both of these things at the same time. So the white stripe morph may be maximizing defending resources and the tan stripe morph might be maximizing parental care. So we should expect that alleles that benefit the white stripe strategy should be accumulating inside the supergene. In other words, um, if there's a mutation that happens to benefit the, the white stripe strategy, that should be selected for. And so that's what we think has happened here, that the supergene alleles of both of these genes are working together to enhance territoriality, maybe even at the expense of parental behavior. So the idea that genes inside inversions can work together is, of course, not new. This idea was discussed decades ago by Dobjansky, who hypothesized that the adaptive value of inversions was exactly that, that they capture together alleles that work well together. For example, let's imagine that there's this chromosome that has a gene that encodes a ligand and a gene that encodes the, the ligand's receptor. And let's say that there are multiple alleles so that the blue allele works best with the blue, uh, the blue ligand works best with the blue receptor and vice versa for the red. Now imagine that there's a crossing over event so that those alleles get separated from each other on some chromatids. So now you have chromatids where there's a mismatch and these don't work as well together. So let's come back to ZEL2 and ZEL2M because recombination is suppressed here, the alleles on ZEL2M are always inherited together and they've had all this time to co-adapt to each other. So whereas with the ZEL2 and you can get uh, recombination and you can get the separation of those alleles. In the case of a super gene, um, those alleles can't be separated, which confers an advantage to the individuals that do have the super gene. So this sparrow actually offers a lot of really interesting opportunities to maybe demonstrate co-adaptation um, between uh, proteins that work together. So I've told you about only two genes that are in there, but there are many more, some of which work together. For example, the alpha subunit of lutein hormone and follicle stimulating hormone and the receptors for those hormones are all inside the inversion. There's a glutamate receptor that is known to interact with ER alpha in cell membranes. There's two serotonin receptors. There's nuclear receptors like SRC1. 
There's one called fierce that's involved in aggression. So there's lots of opportunities to demonstrate real life examples of co-adaptation inside the super gene. Now, before I finish up, I need to tell you that ZAL2M is not the only huge chromosomal rearrangement in white-throated sparrows. Chromosome three is also polymorphic. It's got a gigantic inversion that's even bigger than ZAL2M. It's got almost a thousand genes. And just like ZAL2M, it was originally described by Thornycroft and he named this one uh, 3A for acrocentric, which just means there's very little uh, material on the other side of the centromere. Now, my postdoc, Nicole Barron, is taking a close look at this chromosome, and she's genotyped every white-throated sparrow we've ever collected DNA on, so literally hundreds of birds. And she found that there are three genotypes. Most of the birds, 77%, are 3A, 3A. But then there's 21% that are heterozygous and only 2% homozygous for ZAL3. We don't have any evidence of assortative or disassortative mating. It looks random. And we also don't have a phenotype yet. All we know is that the, there could be a disadvantage to being 3-3. So what we see here is this is mass to wing cord residual, which is just a way of calculating body condition. And it looks like the 3-3 homozygotes are in worse condition, both males and females, than the other genotypes. So stay tuned for that story to unfold a lot more later this year. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that this bird is a really special model with the potential to help us connect gene sequence to behavior. Um, and today we got only up to here, so there's a lot of work left to be done. A lot of people to thank because I've been working with the species for 20 years, but I just want to call out Jim Thomas and Su Jin Yi, who, who supervised all the genomics part of this work. Um, here you can see Jenny with her Illinois uh, shirt on. And of course, my um, funding sources, NSF and NIH, and I will be happy to take questions. All right. Thank you so much for that delightful talk. I am sure I'm trying to see if we could see the participants. Can we switch to participant view so we can see everybody? So if people want to ask oh, questions. Oh, you want me to stop? Oh, I don't know. If, oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I see. Mark has his hands yes. up. Go for it. Thank you so much, Donna. It's great to see you. Uh, it's been too. long. Um, so my question is, is how can, you know, genes code for um, aggression, increased aggression, for instance, only for conspecific intruders. Do you know if these birds are also protecting, you know, the nest better from blue jays and cowbirds and, you know, other type of threats? We don't have any data on that. So um, we, I guess the, the way I would answer that is that I believe that this gene expression, the, the brain region is really important. Right. So we know that if we look in other brain region and I showed you some data from other brain regions, sometimes that morph difference goes in the other direction. Sometimes there's a correlation with aggression, sometimes not. And so I think the, the way to follow up on this would really be to, to look at those ER alpha positive cells in Tania. Where are they projecting? I'd love to use dreads to activate them and see what happens. Right. Um, so I it's it's. And, and, and I think that Tania is, we don't know a lot about this brain region. I wish more people would study it. Um, it's part of the social behavior network, of course, um, very similar. That's why I said it was similar to the mammalian medial amygdala. And so I don't know that it is as involved in other types of aggression as territorial aggression, right? Um, what I will say, and this is probably relevant to your question, is that during the non-breeding season, when levels of um, estradiol and testosterone are very low, there's no morph difference in behavior. So if you look at, so during the winter, they're going to flock, they're going to form flocks. If you look within a flock, they, well, they'll form a dominance hierarchy and morph is unrelated to rank during the non-breeding season. And this is something we've shown in the lab, right? So we can put uh, birds that have never met before into a flight cage, let them sort out their dominance hierarchy. And we found that morph 
predicts rank only when they're photostimulated, right? So when they're, it's hard to get them in reproductive condition in the lab because they don't breed in the lab. But if they're not photostimulated, then morph is completely unrelated to rank. So it would surprise me if there is any morph difference in other kinds of aggression that would be happening year round. In general, all of the morph differences in behavior that I'm aware of, um, with one potential exception that was described by the Tuttle Lab, they're all during the breeding season, which is one reason why we wanted to look at, at sex steroid receptors in particular. Absolutely, thank you. Great, thank you. I see uh, Gene Robinson has his hand up. Yes, thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much for, for giving it. Um, I have uh, a question related to the sort of an evolutionary perspective on this. Um, we um, uh, are all well familiar with the uh, quantitative model, the infinitesimal model, genes with small effects, and GWAS studies in human behavioral variation are um, very much consistent with that. And then we have these um, amazing stories of super genes <laughs> such as such as yours so, so beautifully rendered today. So what do you make of that? <laughs> I think humans have very complicated behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. So your behavior that you're studying is not? Sorry? The behavior you're studying is not complicated? Oh, well, yeah, that's a great point. It's extremely complicated. And it's it's behavior in free living animals, which is something that, I mean, I'm always amazed that we can detect these effects at all. Um, but I do think, like I said before, I do think that because this is a sex steroid receptor, there it it's having a lot of of effects downstream, right? A lot, a lot. Of ple it's very highly pleiotropic, and so it's affecting not only singing, but we also see morph differences in some of the other aggressive behaviors that they do in response to STI. Um, so I mean, it's a hard question to answer. Be because we haven't done anything like QTL or you can't do GWAS with these because our sample sizes are just too small, right? So it so we have to, so far, I mean, we have RNA-seq data. We've done some sort of discovery-based hypothesis-free looks at, you know, at this to, to look, like Wendy had a paper a few years ago in genes, brain, and behavior, where she looked for gene modules that were predictive, um, differential, differentially expressed and predictive of, um, of singing, right? And there are modules of genes of which ESR1 is a, is a hub, right? Or it's involved, it's, it's, it's included in those modules. So there are other genes, but from my perspective, so I'm trained as a behavioral neuroendocrinologist. So my, the way that I interact with those data is to look at the list of genes and go, oh, that, <laughs> that one, I want to test that one. And so that's really, you know, what we're looking at here, where we're approaching the system coming at it with the knowledge or that we already have, right? And so we're testing hypotheses that are based on decades and decades of research on songbirds and what we know about what the control of these behaviors, parental behavior and territoriality. Thank you. I see Hina Zhao has a hand up. Oh, hi, yeah. Uh, Thanks for uh, having this seminar. It's really interesting. And uh, I just have two questions. So the first is that, um, what are the age range of the tested bird subject? Because like mesolation is also um, related to aging. So I'm just mm -hmm. wonder, wondering if that would be contributing factor to the research topic. I'm not, uh, I, I'm late for the seminar. So I'm sorry if I, uh, you already said that. Oh, no, no, no. Um, so we don't know how old they are in most cases. So okay. when we collect birds in during fall migration, we can do um, a procedure called sculling, which is when you look at the um, the the basically the skull for signs of um, development being finished. And so we can tell in fall in fall migration, we can tell the difference between a bird that has never bred before it's in its first year versus one that is older than that. But beyond that, we can't tell their age. Um, 
Now, having said that, I showed some data from nestlings. So those we do know the age, um, but all of the adults, we, we can tell you whether they're hatch year or after hatch year. But again, that's only if they're collected during fall migration, because once we're up at a, um, a field site, like in Minnesota or in Maine, where we're studying breeding birds, then they're all, we don't have a way to age them at that point. I see. Thank but we you. do see differences uh, in methylation and just the levels of methylation, particularly for VIP, um, which is less methylated in nestlings than adults. But at this point, we can only make the comparisons between post-hatch day seven and adults of unknown age. Go on, sorry. Thank you. Did you have another yeah, question? Uh, and yeah, the other question is like uh, pretty naive because I'm completely from another field. I just wonder, uh, is is it difficult to do like a knockout? Because I uh, I uh, heard that you always do knockdown in birds. Yeah, yeah. Just curious. It is, it is. Yeah. You would think that okay. because birds are in eggs, it might be easier to manipulate them. Right. Um, but, and there are people who have gotten knocked down or knock out to work in birds. Um, but it's technically challenging, right? So we find that the knockdown works fine and we're lucky that it does. Cause you know, when you're working with a wild species, a lot of you, you all already know, um, that sometimes your tools can be limited on the model. So thank you so much. I see Ava Fisher has her hand up. Hi, yeah, thank you for your great talk. It's such a wonderful system and I've been Thanks. so excited to follow the work in general. Um, so I guess maybe hearkening back to what you're saying about um, ESR alpha and the pleiotropic effect, something that I've always found so fascinating about behavioral neuroendocrinology is to think about how hormones mediate suites of traits and how you, how sort of hooking them up or unhooking them from hormonal traits from hormonal control can influence evolutionary patterns. Yeah. And so I'm wondering in thinking about this co-adaptation and the fact that you see the um, promoters changing, like it seems like there's some ability to kind of uncouple and recouple traits. So do you think the selection is actually at the behavioral level? So these birds are like being selected for alternative strategies, being more territorial versus being parental, or that it's coming more from like side effects of the inversion? I don't know if that that was a very long question that hopefully made some semblance. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I got all of it, but you know, when when you think about life history trade-offs, and, and it really depends on the species, right? So there are there there is evidence of testosterone su uh, suppressing parental behavior. Like if you treat them with testosterone, you see a suppression of parental behavior in some species, but not others. Um, in some cases, it could be entirely mediated at the behavioral level, like maybe having higher testosterone just makes you feel like singing more and you haven't got any time to engage in parental. So it's not that the testosterone is directly inhibiting parental care. It's the it's a time management thing that's entirely mediated at the at the level of behavior. Um, so so right. So I did does that address at all. So maybe yeah that. yeah i think so i'm for i have the pleasure of meeting with you tomorrow too okay, so okay. i'll Sorry. let somebody else ask a question thank you okay i see paul has a hand up thanks allison um donna so awesome talk i really liked it um uh, second time i saw it so it's really good uh, um, <laughs> Sorry. my question is <laughs> you must have been you must have, did, you must have did sbn this year yeah <laughs> um my question was, um, when, when you looked at the, um, when you saw that it was not a SNP change in the, in the POM it, that was differentiating the, um, the, the ESR1 expression in what is essentially the pre-optic region, do you have any idea why the, do you have any clues of, of, of why your um, inversion in the super gene might be regulating epigenetic changes between your two morphs? Um, I'm not, so, so in the, are you talking about the VIP at the methylation yeah, you, of VIP? I, I think, 
I thought it was ESR1, but you, you were showing that there was uh, methylation differences mm -hmm. in, in uh, methylation differences between your two morphs, but it couldn't be explained by CPG island differences. It was somehow, and so you, you, you hypothesized that it was completely epigenetic. The methylation right, was doing right. something right. Yeah, and I was wondering if you, you've given any, any thought of what mechanism <clears throat> through your super gene, you know, morph, where you would think that more, you know, drift or, or evolutionary mechanism yeah. might work happen? What, what, how, how might this epigenetic change happen? Well, I mean, I think it boils down to, you know, we've got this ZAL2 allele that is present in the tan stripe birds and the white stripe birds, same genetic sequence. And so that's what makes it interesting that it looks like this differential methylation, and this is VIP, is it, it's still there. We still detect it, even if we exclude the polymorphic sites uh, from the analysis. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so, so yeah, I mean that it's not what we expected to see given that, given what we saw with ESR one, which was kind of the opposite. And so, you know, this isn't published. We haven't had a lot of time to think about it, but just what it tells me is that these two alleles, it matters which morph it's in. It's the same, uh, the same genetic sequence. That's the same chromosome, but somehow being in a white stripe bird, the there's there's some epigenetic regulation going on there that's different for the same genetic sequence that's really all i can i mean yeah <laughs> yeah no i'm just trying to think i i'm just trying to think of like you know um what could be the mechanisms because it's mm -hmm. so so fascinating but i could imagine that there may be some some allelic differences in some um chromatin remodel or a chromatin writer sure. or something like that yeah so anyway i was just wondering if yeah you had jenny jenny's thought. got some attack seek data that we're hoping to publish soon um looking and this is looking specifically at esr1 and also looking um more genome wide well i look so, forward to finding yeah. out the results when you do <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks so, so we do have a few um, questions in the chat, um, and then um, I, we do we have booked Donna for a whole series of meetings this afternoon, so might lead to let her go. But we'll um, try to cover these questions in the chat. Um, one of them I think should be easy to to answer. Um, Danny Goldkakar asked, "Which tissue did you use for RNA seq? Um, which brain tissue?" Yeah, so we've done RNA seq um, only in brain. We've done punches of hypothalamus and then punches of tania. And then there's another group by the name of Horton, but not the same Horton, who have looked at some other tissues. I think it's liver muscle. So those data are out there and we have used those data. Um, my postdoc, Nicole, who's looking at ZAL3 is using some of their data, but all of our RNA-seq has been in brain, in particular brain regions. And I can see the chat. Is it Syed? Is that, am yes, I pronouncing that's right. that right? Uh, Zal2Ms are very rare. Since you found one, wondering if it's possible to breed them in the lab and boost the pet. Oh, I'd love to do that. They don't breed in captivity. Um, and Elena Tuttle uh, studied them for even more years than I have. And she also uh, did not get them to breed in captivity. But that 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 would be wonderful if we could do that. So that's something that uh, we would have loved to have done with the homozygote that we captured. Um, but you know, it would be one of those projects where it would take a long time <laughs> to to get them to the point where they breed in captivity. So um, that's not possible right now. I think that was all. Yes. Great. Well, um, if you can imagine lots of applause from okay. the audience, um, we'll have to have you come back again sometime when we can meet you in person. But thank you for such a delightful talk. And I know many of us are looking forward to um, meeting with you later in the day and okay. uh, the rest of the week. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.